Okay, so uh, Rachel's just pressed the uh, start to today's webinar. It's been quite a while. I think it's been about two months since we've done a multi hole solutions webinar. And as, uh, as always, we're just going to uh, uh, just take a couple of minutes to allow everyone that's uh, registered to, to enter today's presentation. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we're well over 200 people have registered to watch today. So uh, even though COVID lockdowns have stopped and, um, and everyone's back to uh, normal in many respects, obviously everyone still wants to know everything they can about sailing and why not talk about one of the best coasts in, uh, in the world, the, uh, the Queensland coast today. So uh, just letting the ticker flick through there. Uh, in the background waiting to have a chat today is Greg Luck, who is the author of this uh, newly released book called The Cruising the Queensland Coast, and John Hembrow, who many of you know from our previous webinars, uh, who will be talking today, uh, co-hosting with myself, and also will be talking today about the second or the alternate uh, route north, which is... Uh, going by the uh, outer islands, so going outside the Great Barrier Reef if you want to cruise up the coast in that, uh, in that manner. So in many respects, today's presentation is a, a presentation of two halves. One is about cruising up the in, inside of the Great Barrier Reef, which is probably the, the well-worn track for most cruisers. And then John, who's pushing into that newer um, opportunity of sailing out through the, uh, the outer reef networks up the coast. So I think we've got quite a few people registered there now. So we'll flick over and, uh, and keep moving along today. Uh, as I say, this is a, a webinar that we record and many of you are probably aware uh, that you can go back and watch our webinars on YouTube, uh, whether that be on the multi Hole Solutions YouTube channel or the Yacht Sales Co YouTube channel. And there's a a real good library or a real good uh, library of resource there. Now, most of the things, I, I think we've covered a lot of good topics over the last couple of years since we started these in early 2020. And so if there's something you'd like to know, uh, you probably may find it on uh, one of our webinars. So it's certainly a, a worthwhile look to go onto our YouTube channel and uh, look through all our playlists. Okay. Now, normally we would then talk about what is our next webinar, but at the moment we don't have a next webinar scheduled. That doesn't mean that we won't have one. We'll probably do some pop-up webinars as we go through the year. But what we would like to do is just remind everyone of the upcoming multi-hole solutions and yacht sales co-events. Uh, we have the Sanctuary Cove Boat Show on the Gold Coast from the 19th to the 22nd of May. That's a, uh, a normal part of our season. And that is going ahead in its normal fashion this year. So we're very much looking forward to that. For those of you who really want to uh, be, get adventurous and have some good wine and some good company, come and join myself and a few of our team uh, in La Rochelle in France uh, from the 24th to the 27th of June. I'm sorry, it's not free or, or anything. You have to pay your way, but uh, it'll be certainly a good, good weekend. And part of that weekend will be some factory tours of the uh, Fontaine de Joe factory and the uh, Dufour factory, uh, and probably the Neil factory as well, actually. And then we'll also, um, hopefully, if we get the right level of numbers, we'll do a couple of nice lunches and we'll also do some boat show view, uh, sorry, boat viewings and so on. So I just wanted to plug that weekend. And then the Sydney Boat Show is going ahead this year, the Can Yachting Festival. Come and join us yet again. A very good uh, few days can be had in Cannes in the south of France for what is probably the biggest, uh, well, I would say the biggest on-water boat show that we attend each year, but it's a fantastic show. And then a very exciting event in October. Uh, many of you will know Mariner Boating and Trevor Joyce. We've done a few webinars with him over the last couple of years and his, uh, his team. Uh, so from the 1st to the 8th of October, uh, you can go on to the multi Hole Solutions or Yacht Sail Co website, go to the event page, and you can download more detail about our Mediterranean rendezvous, uh, which will be in Turkey, uh, setting out for Marmaris. Uh, so if you haven't done Turkey, this is the year to do it. And he's picked a good time of the year to do it there. Not so busy. Uh, so that's, that's that one. So moving along. 
as always, if you want to ask questions today, or if you want to leave a comment or tell us uh, what, what you know that we haven't mentioned, just uh, click on your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question. We will generally answer in this uh, webinar today, we'll probably answer or cover off all of those questions at the end in a Q&A session. Um, I do need to just uh, give a, 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 not a warning, but make you all aware, we, we have a habit of letting these webinars that we do with John Hembrow go for quite a while. So this isn't going to be a half hour webinar or one hour webinar, it could stretch on beyond that. Uh, but that's all right, we're happy to do that because then it can be put up onto the YouTube channel. So if you get uh, a while through this today and you start going, oh, can't keep up, got to go and get the kids, then that's all right, you can come back and watch it. And so if you have asked a question, we'll still answer it whether you're there or not. Uh, so you can come back and, uh, and have a look at that. But the, yeah, so the Q&A session we'll probably do at the end today. We'll, uh, we'll probably avoid interrupting with questions today as we go but we will be keeping an eye on it all the way through. Okay. Uh, I'm Greg Boller. I've been uh, the New York Sales Manager for Multi Hall Solutions for a while now. And um, we've been doing these webinars, Rachel and I, since early 2020 when COVID started. So if you've watched any of our webinars, you'll know how it all goes. All right. Hello, Rachel. In the background. There. Hello there, Boller. <laughs> okay. Rightio. And then over the page there. All right, so sitting there on the screen is John Hembrow, who uh, has been, uh, obviously we've worked in partnership very well over the last couple of years, but the Down Under Cruiser rallies. I'm actually not gonna talk about John, I'm gonna let you talk, John. Uh, and I, I believe you've also got, because of COVID, you've come up with some new and inventive ways of uh, making things happen. One of those is your membership program. So it'd be good to hear about all that. Well, thank you, Greg, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for choosing to spend uh, this time with us and, and uh, listening to what we have to say. Um, those that don't know who I am, um, my wife, Leanne, and I departed Australia back in 2008, and um, we spent uh, nearly, uh, been almost 12 years um, cruising away from Australia, um, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, New Zealand, and then the west coast of the USA, Central America, and across the Pacific, um, back to Australia. So we've been uh, we've been out there, and and we've been and discovered a lot of new places, and learned a lot of lessons, and had some wonderful experiences. Um, the last seven years prior to COVID were done in the boat that you see on the screen, Songline. She was a fifty foot ocean catamaran. Um, and she did us, uh, did us proud. She took us backwards and forwards from Australia to Fiji uh, every year. And um, uh, we recently um, sold Song Lines, multi hole Solutions um, helped us with that and sold her. Uh, we're, so we're in between boats and uh, we're looking for uh, something a bit different. So there'll be more about that as the time goes on. But in the meantime, we're fortunate enough to have some of our rally participants who are happy to have us aboard. And so we're enjoying the OPBs or what uh, other people's boats, which is quite uh, interesting for us and gives us the opportunity to share some of our experience with those that are participating in the rally that don't mind having some company aboard. So that's how we're managing um, our sailing at the moment. And um, we'll see how that progresses. Greg did mention um, the members program. So during COVID, we typically with our rallies, rallies we offer people um, who join the rally a lot of um, added benefits, such as discounts from our um, broad supplier of marine, our, our rally partner businesses who are all marine related product and service providers. Um, and typically prior to last year, you had to join one of our rallies to be able to access those benefits. Um, and what we discovered was that a lot of people were preparing their boats and preparing themselves, um, you know, up to two or three years in advance. And they really needed access to all of these, these advantages well before they joined the rally three months before they were supposed to be leaving. So we created a member program whereby if you become a Down Under Rally member at $125 a year, you get access to all of our, our uh, rally partner businesses, uh, their offers and on their products and services. You get unlimited access to our, uh, our offshore cruising preparation course, which is a 10 one-hour videos on um, everything from 
preparing your boat and your crew for extended coastal or blue water cruising. And we're here on the telephone or by email for individual advice and support about anything at all for our members. So if anyone was interested in, in getting involved in that, you can see that that's available and you can just go to our website and click become a member and all the info will be there. There will be people watching this either now or later on on the recorded version that uh, are perhaps thinking to sailing to Australia from overseas. Um, we've been running the Go West Yacht Rally since 2015 and we've uh, helped well over 200 internationally flagged yachts with their uh, crews aboard to come to Australia and spend the season or more uh, cruising in Australia. So we assist with all the arrival procedures, make sure you've got everything in order um, and you're fully informed of what you need to do to, to have a, a, a good experience arriving in Australia with the formalities. And then we provide a welcome week um, in Bundaberg Port Marina, um, which is a week of events, including cruising seminars for the whole of the east coast of Australia, from, from Tasmania in the south right up to Cooktown in the north. Over a week, we do uh, those sessions uh, live and uh, everyone's found them very informative. And we don't mind a party or two. So we'll have a party, we'll have a few sing-alongs, we've got mud crab races and all sorts of stuff that we carry on with up there in uh, Welcome Week in Bundaberg, usually in around the middle of November, early middle of November. So just jump on the Go West Rally website or, or the Down Under Rally website, go to the Go West Rally if you're thinking about sailing to Australia. Um, I think you'll find that we're a very valuable resource and, and we can help you out. Very good. Um, Prior to COVID, we ran the Go East Rally to New Caledonia every year. And uh, obviously that didn't happen in 21 and 2020. Uh, and we've decided for various reasons, we weren't going to run it again this year. We want everything to just settle down a bit and go back to 100% normal. Uh, I'm not gonna get into all the reasons why we didn't do it, but there was, there was a multitude of them. So we chose to defer that, but it's on again uh, in full swing in 2023. So if you'd like to experience a blue water passage um, to New Caledonia and Vanuatu and spend five months exploring those, those destinations, uh, we can make that happy for, happen, happen for you, excuse me. So again, just our website, all the info is there. So let's get on with it, cruising the Queensland coast. Is this the best cruising ground in the world? I mean, that's a subjective question. I think it is. Uh, I guess I'm biased, I'm born and bred in Queensland, so I'm a Queenslander. Um, but I have had the, the, the benefit of, of doing a lot of cruising elsewhere. And um, this coast is extraordinary. And I really didn't realise how extraordinary it was until COVID. And we found ourselves cruising in our backyard again after having not done so for, for 10 years or more. Um, and it was, it was a, a real eye opener for me as to just how good our coast is with the variety of experiences from champagne sailing to sheltered you know, anchors, anchorages up in rivers and creeks and, and in estuaries to the blue water of the barrier reef and all the islands. Um, it, predictable weather, very convenient, marinas, um, lovely beaches. It, it is just an extraordinary cruising ground. You can sail for two or three hours and be at your next destination. I mean, it, it, you, you can spend a lifetime, literally a lifetime cruising this coast and not see all that it has to offer. So, yes, I think it's the best cruising ground in the world. What about you, Greg Boller? You've been to a few places and seen a few yeah. things. Yeah, I tend to agree. And I'm like you, born and bred Queenslander. I've spent a, a, a massive amount of my life up there along that coastline and also surrounded by a lot of friends who, and that was from my uh, time as uh, owning and operating Sunsail, the yacht charter company out of Hamilton Island there for 12 years. A lot of our staff and, and the people who work with us and our friends were living on yachts and were cruisers who would go off and cruise and then come back to work for us to fill up their bank account and then go off again. And there's people who've been doing it for, for as you say, for years. And, and then through all of that, uh, having sailed in the, in the Mediterranean and, and also obviously all through Asia with everything we had over there, um, yeah, there's something to be said about the Queensland coast. It's 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 long. Uh, there's always somewhere to uh, tuck into. Uh, there's always a breeze, especially if you're going north. <laughs> um, and it's yeah, it's it's special. And you're so right about the clarity of the water. And yeah, this it, it's a great coast to grow up on. A great coast to uh, call home, if you know what I mean. 
And I think it's a really good proving ground as well. It, it gives you the opportunity to hone those sailing skills with enough of the offshore opportunities if you want to get out there and have some blue water sailing. Um, and and then the you know uh, uh, to really find out whether that that extended blue water sailing for you or whether you're more of a coastal cruiser, it, it gives you that opportunity to 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 explore the options. So yeah, I'm 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 a big fan. So very good. If we're going to go cruising the Queensland coast, we've got to make a decision. A lot of people um, over the years have have done the Queensland coast and they do it repeatedly and they go from the Gold Coast um, or further up as their departure point, wherever they based, and uh, they head north for the winter. Um, now you can do that via the coast and the coastal, you know, the, the, the Queensland coast from the Gold Coast to Cooktown, let alone what lies beyond that up to Cape York is 900 nautical miles. So, you know, it's a long way and there's a lot to see. So if you are happy to just go up and back on the same route, you can do that endlessly and find different places and different experiences and go to all the different anchorages and the different places, um, you know, for a lifetime. If, however, you've been up there and you've come back and you don't really want to sail the same ground again, or you want to get north quickly so that you can make your way back south slowly, the other option is to do the alternate route, which is the offshore route. So this is something we did last year twice and we're doing again this year. Uh, we depart Bundaberg and head at 200 odd nautical miles outside of the barrier reef to the coral reef caves of the Coral Sea Marine Park. Um, so heading out from Bundaberg out into the Coral Sea Marine Park, visiting the, the, the destinations you can see that are shown on the maps there and back into Townsville, a little bit of a break in Townsville to reprovision and, and, and uh, go and have a beer in a pub and then back out again from Townsville and head back out and do the northern section of these outer Coral Sea Island reefs and back in. So, you know, essentially you've gone from Bundaberg to, to Port Douglas, well up north, um, a lot quicker than you would do if you were just picking your way day, day by day up the coast and then you can spend your time coming back down. This place out here is extraordinary. Um, as I said, I've been across the Pacific and, and you know, it was calling me. Um, <laughs> Tahiti and the Tuamotus archipelagos and all of these isolated coral reefs and caves and beaches and things that I knew that were out there. What I didn't know is that this was on my back door. And thanks to Peter Sayer um, and another couple called Jack and Jude, who have spent extensive periods of time out here and both have written guides to this Coral Sea Marine Park, I started to get interested in it. And um, I fortunately was, was able to put together, forced through COVID to do something. We put together these rallies, the Beyond the Barrier Rally, and we've been taking people out there. Uh, I've got goosebumps now just talking about it. It is extraordinary. It's rough, it's raw, it's not for the lot faint hearted, and it is truly an adventure. Um, and you've got to have your wits about you and know, you know what you're doing but uh if you're up for it it's one hell of an adventure and you don't leave the australian waters but i'll talk to you more about that after the queensland queensland coastal route presentation by greg luck um just quickly greg's going to be mentioning greg luck is going to be mentioning in his presentation some articles that we've been putting in our make sailing magazine ahoy uh, greg's been doing an article a month on cruising the queensland coast and he's taking you coast uh, section by section up the Queensland coast in these articles in our Ahoy Sailing magazine. So when you're hearing mentioning this during his presentation, if you want to go and look at the articles he's talking about, just jump onto our website and, and find Ahoy and you can subscribe there for free and go to all the back issues and, uh, and see all the information. And there's a lot of other cool stuff in there as well. So check out Ahoy. All right, well, I'll shut up. And I'll uh, introduce you now to, to this chap, uh, Greg Luck, who I came across because he contacted me about including some information about the Down Under Rally in this new cruising guide that he was writing. And um, I've got to say, I've re read a lot of cruising guides and this one is, is just a great blend of information and uh, motivation. I'll let Greg show it to you. Good morning, Greg. Well, afternoon, I should say. Yeah, thanks, John. Oh, all right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, I, uh, I've spent some time in the Caribbean and the Mediterranean. Um, and um, yeah, you know, Queensland, Queensland's got the largest number of uh, 
uh, boat licenses in Australia and the largest number of registered boats. I mean, we really are a boating state and we we do have a fantastic backyard. And it was one of my motivations to write, write this new cruising guide. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I've, been, um, I've been cruising since 2010 on a 45 foot um, Bavaria monohull uh, called Curl or Skate. A um, couple of years ago, so I've been up and back, I don't know, about 15 times. Um, uh, doing really the coastal route, as as uh, as John Hembro was describing, and uh, yeah, I'm not sick of it yet. Um, it's there's just always something new to do and something new to see. Um, a couple of years ago, I got my RYA yacht master and got commercially qualified, which was kind of good for filling in some some gaps. And um, and these days, I work as a commercial skipper. Um, and in the past, I was a tech guy, so I had a tech career. And, and I suppose, you know, a lot of people ask me, why is this, why is Cruising the Queensland Coast an e-book? Uh, why isn't it a printed book? And, you know, I, I do find, I use, um, I use the apps. Uh, I use all the weather apps and Navionics and CMAP and everything heavily. And, um, and I just love the convenience in the e-book of actually having lots and lots of links I can click on and I've done Navionics integration. So I, I am techie and, and that's, I guess, where some of the techie features in the book come from. Yeah. And we were talking last night, Greg, and, and hello, and it's great to have you with us today. We were talking last night. It's been a long time since someone's written a Cruising the Queensland Coast book. That's it, yeah. Um, so Alan Lucas um, wrote Cruising the Coral Coast, which we'll refer to as the Bible, and uh, we all have copies of it. Um, so that actually first came out in 1968, um, and then he's done 14 editions of, of that book. Uh, the most recent update was was 2014. Um, but yeah, in terms of somebody taking on the whole coast, it's a huge coast, 900 nautical miles. In terms of somebody taking it on, um, yeah, it's uh, th there was Noel Patrick who wrote um, who wrote the book on the Curtis Coast. Um, sadly, he passed away in '97, and that book was withdrawn from print last year. So I, I did feel that there were there was a little bit of a void. And, and I, I kind of wanted something for my own benefit. And that was another motivation to basically write, write a guide. There's more people. I mean, you know, Greg Bowler, you're part of this. Um, there's, there's more and more, there's more and more cats out there. There's more and more people, um, you know, doing extended cruising up the Queensland coast. There's more people than ever. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, there is a need, there is a need for cruising guides. Totally, and there's so much has changed tech-wise, as you said, since 2014 to now. Yeah. 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 All right. All right, let's move on. Okay, so um, so in the abstract for this, for this presentation, I kind of thought about some of the things, you know, the book itself is about 550 pages. There's a lot of coast. You know, let's sort of touch on, on on some of the things at this time of the year. You know, this is the very start of the cruising season. Let's look at let's look at some of the things to consider as part of planning planning your cruise. And um, and so the first part I want to talk about is just a few uh, a few things around planning. So the first one first one is just to talk about the weather. Um, now we have very very distinct um, wind patterns. Um, what we have here is we've got wind rises for Rockhampton um, and, then, and then Townsville. Um, and in, um, in the winter, the winter pattern, which is they call the dry season from May to September, um, you'll, see, you'll see in the 9 a.m. wind rise for Rockhampton, the, the wind most of the time is from the southeast. Um, now that's the trade winds. And then you'll see in the afternoon, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you get a sea breeze added. So the, the prevailing trade wind is still the same. You just have a, a sea breeze laid on top of it. Um, now, if we go up to Townsville, um, uh, similar thing. Um, you've got um, south, some southerlies and some southeasterlies uh, during the dry season. And then um, in the afternoon, the wind is, is from the, the northeast. It's basically perpendicular to the coast. So the coast there runs runs northwest, so therefore your sea breeze is going to be 90 degrees perpendicular. Um, so, so these winds are very, very good for going up the coast. Um, now, um, what to do about coming back? Um, so you're, what happens when you get to November, um, you get into the summer 
um, or wet season pattern, and it's a different pattern. Now I'm showing the wind roses here for November. Um, if, you, if you check, and I have checked, like each of the months going forward, they're very, very similar. So, so what you see is you just get a lot more variability. So, you know, looking at, let's say we're up in North Queensland, uh, Townsville, look at that. You've got northeasterlies, you've got easterlies in the afternoon, sea breeze added on top. I mean, basically you've got, you've got winds that you can, you can sail on a beam reach to coming south. And then once you get further, further, further south to, to Rocky, once again, variable, you do have a little bit of southeast. But basically you've got, you can, you can wait for a weather pattern of, of, of northerlies to come along and they can take you home. So it's an extremely important pattern uh, to understand for Queensland cruising. Yeah, the procession south generally always happens towards that, that end of the season when people are waiting for that northerly weather, you know, the week of northerlies to come in. That's it, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, we didn't go north in 2020, but 2019, we were sitting there at Alley Beach getting the, yes. getting the mast re-rigged. And, um, and then we, the northerly started about four days before the re-rigging was finished. It was, yes. it was frustrating. Everybody took off. We were alone in the marina. <laughs> yeah. Waiting for the next one. All right. Yeah. Um, so the other, um, in terms of the Queensland coast, I'd also mentioned the abstract. We talk about um, potential weather hazards. So I've just got a single slide on this. Um, in the book, there's an entire chapter of the book devoted to this, and we really go into it in some detail. Um, taking, taking the summer uh, season, so if we go from November to, to April, the wet season, so this is, this is the cyclone season. The official cyclone season is 1 November to 30th of April. Here in Queensland, it's also the, uh, the storm season. So two of these hazards... Cyclones and severe thunderstorms are a, are a summer phenomenon. Um, and our recommendation to you and what most people do is to actually cruise, cruise you know, during that period, uh, May, um, and, and be basically heading south in October, November. Um, now, the, um, in terms of the, the two other um, systems to be aware of, um, so East Coast lows, these are predominantly a weather pattern for the New South Wales coast. The entire New South Wales coast these occur on, and it's only the very bottom corner of, of Queensland up to the top of Fraser Island. Um, very easily mitigated um, here, and, and I've actually, in, um, in the Hoy magazine, as, as John said, um, we, we've left, through the March, April and May editions, we've left the Gold Coast and we've gone up, um, we've gone up to, um, to Fraser Island, and you can actually stay on the inside. You can do the inside passage, you can do Morton Bay, then you can do Sandy Straits. Yeah. So, you know, um, with East Coast lows, the, the Bureau forecasts those uh, well ahead of time. And, and here, in, uh, so if you're coming up from New South Wales, uh, you need to be aware of those for the New South Wales coast. Once you get to Queensland, it's only that bottom corner, very easily avoided uh, by, doing the, by staying on the inside, which is what most cruisers do. Um, and that just leaves really one, which is strong cold fronts. Now, strong cold fronts are also a phenomenon uh, for the southern part of Australia. Um, there's actually a strong cold front coming through um, over the next few days. Now, so with, you know, Western Australia, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania and, and New South Wales. Now, here in Queensland, the, the cold fronts really only reach up to about the Tropic of Capricorn. After that, they peter out and into a trough. Um, now, you know, with a cold front, you get that, you, you know, when it hits, you can get, you can get some strong winds. Um, you get backing and strong winds for sort of two to six hours and um, you can get an associated line of squalls and, and thunderstorms, but, but in winter, um, much, much less of that. It's mostly just the strong winds. Um, and that's the mitigation for that is just watch the weather. Um, the cold fronts move move across Australia. They start over in Western Australia. Um, you have about four days notice that a cold front is coming. So basically you just, um, just make sure that you, um, you, you figure out where you're gonna be, um, usually in an anchorage really. Um, and um, you know, what I've noticed is that the timing of when the cold front arrives, it's normally spot on to like to the hour. Yeah. Very, very accurate. And then the other one of course is um, 
you know, from all those years of, of up, even up in the winter Sundays is through those winter months, as you said, it's very reliable. If you've got, got your breezes, they're normally going to be coming out of the southern quadrant. And so you know which anchorages are the, the workable anchorages. And then, you know, towards the end of the season, that's when you you've start getting those occasions where you're having to work out which anchorage, and that's where the Naras and the Golnairs come in in the Wit Sundays, as an example, because you just don't know if in the middle of the night that the anchorage that you're safely tucked into is going to get belted by the breeze from the opposite direction. Yeah, so, in, my, yeah. In, my experience, in my experience, the anchorage where a lot of people seem to come to grief with cold fronts is um, the southern anchorage on Great Keppel Island. Yes. Uh, you have a light northerly, everyone's happy, and the cold front's coming through. you just got to watch your weather yes. and just, um, you know, you don't want to be caught uh, uh, on a, uh, with a lee shore when so, a cold front comes in. Just to throw a tip in there, just because you mentioned that particular anchorage, we spent a lot of time up there last year or the year before, um, and you know when these changes are coming through, they just typically come through at 1 o'clock in the morning. That's it. So you're, in, <laughs> you're there in the afternoon, in a lovely uh, anchorage on the southern side of Keppel with, with northerlies blowing, and then one o'clock in the morning, it's going to come in at 25 or 30 knots from the south. So we typically move, knowing that that's coming, we'll move in the afternoon and endure, you know, three or four hours of uncomfortable anchorage on the northern side with northerlies coming in and being in an onshore environment, knowing that at one o'clock yes. in the morning, it's going to go around and we're going to be comfortable when, it, when, when the proverbial hits the fan. So it's often a good idea to move in anticipation of what's coming and anchor in the conditions that you know that you've got for um, knowing that it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but understanding that it's going to save your backside later in the night and you're not going to be in the melee of dragging anchors and all the rest that goes on with people that haven't been paying attention. And then um, one other comment here to make too, in that cruising season from May to October, when we've uh, traditionally got the, the trade winds, the south, south easterlies that, that shift around to the easterlies in the afternoons, in terms of if people are wondering, especially for those who haven't been to Queensland, who are going to be sailing in and doing this, uh, this cruising the Queensland coast from overseas uh, or from other areas of Australia, when the wind is blowing in those directions, you still do get some showers, but it's generally what we call part, you know, um, um, partly cloudy with a chance of a shower is the forecast every day of the season. South southeasterlies 10 to 15 knots increased into 20 knots from the east in the afternoon. Uh, um, partially cloudy, chance of a shower. And all those showers are as a, you know, a little rain scud or whatever that might come through. Temperatures are warm. Um, the conditions are perfect, sailing conditions are perfect, and that's what lends the Queensland coast so much to being a sailor's playground, is just that weather forecast that comes out every day. Yeah, no, it is. It is um, Actually, in the book, um, for each of the coasts, I, I include, include weather statistics, so temperature statistics, rain statistics. Um, the, 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 winter, the winter season, it's called the dry season, so you actually have very little rain normally and uh, very little rain. And then once you, you know, as you go north, uh, it gets warmer and it gets warmer and very pleasant. So, oh. you know, it's just a fan winter, winter and uh, Queensland cruising in winter is fantastic. That's what it boils yes. down to. All right. So on that note, take us north. Um, All right. Jump over to the next slide and let's now take everyone who's with us today. Uh, All right. So, so, yeah, so that, that was a couple of slides on some of the driving factors for why we go north when we do. So boiling it all down, the trade winds, reliable trade winds from the southeast start in May. April's a transition month. Some people head north, start heading north in April. Uh, the weather in, in Harvey Bay and Great Keppel uh, in autumn is really nice. Um, so you sort of, if you, if you sort of start heading up in autumn before it gets cold, you get lovely weather up there. Um, uh, you know, most people wait until the end of the cyclone season. Uh, check your insurance if you're planning on, on, on jumping the gun there. Um, uh, another thing in the book, we've actually got, uh, uh, along with wind roses, we've got uh, wave roses and wave statistics that have been compiled by, um, by, the, by the Queensland government. Um, the waves, the waves from, from about um, June through to, to November are actually lower. And also, as you go north, um, the waves get lower. Now, there's a couple of physical reasons for that. Um, you know, when you're behind, 
um, when you're behind Morton Island, Fraser Island, um, you're actually out of the ocean swell. So you've only got sea state, not swell. And then once you get, um, once you once you sort of hit Lady Musgrave, Lady Lady Musgrave, you actually get, get to the start of the Great Barrier Reef, and then the Great Barrier Reef breaks up the ocean swell as well. So you you know if you if you if you're doing coastal cruising as opposed to ocean cruising, you're going to be on the inside of that and not not getting swell. So so you know uh, lower waves and and the waves get less as you go further north. Um, now um, trade winds will continue continue until September, um, usually into October as well. Um, so you can just keep basically going up. Um, now, um, now La Nina and El Nino. Now um, with La Nina, um, you have stronger trade winds. So the main, the main effect on wind is not a change of direction, just stronger trade winds. Now when the northerlies, now in a La Nina year, northerlies kick in at the same time. There's no delay to when northerlies kick in. They're still going to kick in at the beginning of November. Um, in El Nino years, the trade winds are, are lower and winds will be more variable. So this year at the moment, it's La, we've got a weakening La Nina. So we actually have, have quite a strong trade wind pattern uh, for this season, which is expected to turn neutral um, late autumn, late autumn through to mid winter. Um, now, just one. Now, we've been talking about how these winds change around. Now, for each of the coasts, I actually include all the wind rises and statistics. Things do change a little bit once you get um, into the very far north of the state. So, as you go past Cairns, and then even more so once you're up on the Cooktown coast, um, the wind tends to stay from the southeast almost all of the time, including in the summer season um, in November, December. So, if you do decide, to go, so let's say, all the way up to Lizard or even further, um, you, you need plenty of time because you've got to wait until you get one of those rare uh, northerly periods. Uh, Greg Bowler? Yeah, I totally agree. And we used to run what we call mile catches up there from Hamilton Island to Cape York uh, when we had sun sail. We used to, uh, for many months of the year, always have one of our staff on a boat with four or five students. And, yeah, sometimes they used to... Uh, not be very happy with us for sending them up there. <laughs> All right, so we might keep pushing along. Okay, so you got up there and then, and then when to come south. So there's a couple of considerations. Um, you, you will get, um, you know, even, even during September, October, you know, you look at your wind rises, the wind doesn't blow from the southeast all of the time. So you can start, you can still come south but you just have to, you know, you need more patience to wait for the, for, for the favourable winds. Um, you know, towards the end of October, um, the trade winds weaken and the northerlies start. And, you know, everybody, everybody's watching like a hawk usually for the start of the northerlies and then they hit. And like I said, everybody clears out and starts making their way south. Um, now, November, 1 November is officially the start of storm season and, um, and cyclone season. So, you know, we were, 2019, uh, we went as far as, as um, Orpheus Island and we were actually up there in, um, we we're actually up there in, in late October. So well and truly, you know, up in the, up in the cyclone belt and, um, and you know, we, we, we didn't get back to um, the Gold Coast until the end of November. Um, but you generally want to be making your way south. Um, and the probability of, of coming across a cyclone gets less as you go as you go further south. Um, already mentioned La Nina doesn't really affect the timing. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, because because uh, because the afternoon sea breezes are perpendicular to the coast. Um, if you've got relatively weak winds, you can you still use the afternoon sea breezes to basically get you along. Um, as John Hembro was saying, uh, you know, a lot of the passages can be three, four, five hours to go from one anchorage to another. And that's just an afternoon sail. And you can just gradually pick your way south. So we did plenty of that as well. Okay, very good. All right. Um, anticipating a question that you might have, um, you know, we've talked about, you know, we talked about keeping, keeping in touch with the weather. Obviously, you want to keep in touch with your you know, friends and family, business interests, it's, it's very, very difficult to be completely disconnected. Um, so how do you stay connected? Um, 
there is um so the first thing is that in the book um in the book we provide um we provide um signal strength for uh for every anchorage that we have we have the number of mobile bars that you can expect from telstra why telstra telstra has the largest coastal coverage um now to go to to do better than that you can also add in a, a booster. There's a couple of different brands out there. Um, the one that I that I have um, is the Selfie Go. This is Austel approved. It's Telstra approved. It's a smart system. It doesn't cause any problems on Telstra's network. Um, so I have one of these on my yacht. Uh, I've also got another one at another a fixed remote location. Very happy with it. Um, and have that coupled with a masthead antenna. And so the the the, the mobile coverage that I show um, on the anchorages, that's that's unboosted. And so you can do better than that if you've got a masthead uh, booster. And, and even if you've got a masthead booster, there's some locations where without a booster, you get no coverage and you'll just get enough. You, and, and usually what will happen, you'll, have a, you'll be able to send text messages first, then maybe phone calls, and then you'll get internet. Um, we've been in... Um, We've been in plenty of anchorages where we can't even get TV reception and we're actually watching streaming TV, uh, which is quite amazing. So um, we'll keep um, pushing along to the next slides because I'm just a little bit conscious of time. But what's important there too to add is I know a lot of people, because we're talking coastal cruising here, and I know a lot of people who've actually run their businesses from their sailing boats up and down the Queensland coast because of this. They might not be able to do that if they were going out into the wild blue yonder. It's the coastal cruising nature and the ability to stay connected that is making things so good for them. But let's push along. And I'm sorry to do that to you, Greg, but we're, um, we, uh, we need to get through the slides. Yeah, all right. So now, now we're on to the fun part. And, and that is, let's talk, about, let's talk about the coast. So I actually had a few, few cracks at, at how to present this. Um, there's a lot to talk about. We've got 900 nautical miles. Now it breaks into 13 coasts. Some of these coasts may not be familiar with you. Discovery Coast, Cassowary Coast. These are names that are given by the local councils. Here they are on the on the on the um, on the map here. What we're going to do is um, the way we're going to sort of touch on each one of these coasts is we're, is we're going to show the coast, and then I, I've I've been asked to pick you know one favourite marina and one favourite anchorage. And uh, we'll whiz through those and show you some photos and uh, give you a taste of what to expect. All right. All right, so we go from south to north. Let's start with the Gold Coast. Now, the way I've got this laid out, um, the marina name I've got written in purple, and then we've got it um, marked on the, on the chart in purple. Now, these, these, are, these charts are the ones from the book, the, the head of each uh, chapter. and just another thing, you'll see rectangles. So there's the Marine Stadium, Courage, Tiplis Passage, Jacobs Well. Um, in the book, those, those are where we've got anchorages or further submaps for more detail. Um, and, then, um, and then for anchorages, we've got those in orange, and then we just put a circle around those in orange just to help orientate you. Um, now, we talked before about doing the inside passage. Um, so this is one, this is the, that's the passage route there in that uh, chart in the middle. And uh, that one, that one's uh, included in the book. And it's also in the March edition of um, the Down Under Rally Ahoy magazine. I did see a question uh, right at the start of the presentation. And the question was, you know, what's the distance between uh, locations and is there a table of those? And the answer is yes. In the book, in each one of the coasts, um, we have a passages section. And I have all of the major passages, um, uh, what the distance is in nautical miles, um, a description of the passage and any hazards along the way. And there's also a Navionics um, route that I've created that you can import by clicking, clicking on the little anchor icon. So yeah, that, uh, we've got um, about 140 passages uh, in the book done that way. All right, well, let's have a look at the Southport Yacht Club. Um, so, um, there's the Southport Yacht Club. Uh, they've actually just opened up a new super yacht pontoon. You see in the top photo there. Um, 
I've, I've been a member of Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron for years and years, and um, Southport Yacht Club's a, a reciprocal membership. You get one night free there. Um, I've also done the I've also done the um, the race that they have down here in January a few times. Um, Sail Paradise, and so yeah, I kind of quite like the yacht club and like to head down to Tetter Avenue for a, a meal. Um, in the book, we have um, we have forty five marinas. We have every marina up the Queensland coast. And everything's done in a standard layout, just to make it really easy. A couple of things to point out. Um, there's uh, marina map and rates. If you just want to highlight that, John Hembro, um, the marina map and rates up the top there. Um, and, uh, and then we also have indicative pricing. So you, and I've, used, um, I've used the rate for a 15 metre mono and then a 15 metre multi-hull, which is a good size, but that's, that's, a, you know, that's a good size cruising vessel. And then, you know, it'll give you the comparative. Um, so you can, go, you know, like on the Gold Coast, you can sort of work out who's expensive and who's cheaper. And that may be one factor. Anyway, plenty of other information there. Um, now let's have a look at uh, Marine Stadium. Now, Marine Stadium might be more familiar to you under the name Bums Bay. Um, and that's, uh, that's just tucked in just down there behind the seaway. Um, now, um, you know, for each of the anchorages, uh, we have a um, we have a chartlet um, showing where the where the anchorage will be. Um, there's an infographic shows depths and um, uh, signal strengths and uh, wind directions, recommended wind directions, and so on. Um, marine park zone, um, and then you can click on it to import that into Navionics. So you've got the exact location that I intended. Uh, and then we also have high resolution aerials so you can see any hazards. Um, but it's a really popular spot on the Gold Coast. Just remember that you've got a one week limit um, for staying anywhere um, south of the seaway, after which you, you have to move out of there. All right. Very good. Very good. Take me north. <laughs> yeah, let's keep going. All right, Morton Bay. Um, now, Morton Bay. Um, uh, so a couple of so a couple of highlights there. Um, Tangaloom up the top. Um, to get before we move on to get out of Morton Bay, um, the the route that I recommend is the is the shipping channel, and we cover that in the April edition of Ahoy Magazine. Um, so let's uh, let's take a look at the the marina I've picked, and uh, Royal Queensland Yacht Squadron uh, included a couple of personal picks here. Uh, that's that's Maria and I getting married about four years ago, and we had our reception at the. Um, we took our yacht into the VIP jetty, and we had our reception at RQ. It was very nice. That's a popular spot for weddings, but it's a it's a great. I mean, it's a great, very traditional sailing club. Lots of racing and fixtures and stuff. All right, um, now probably the highlight. And I, I have to jump in there. About hundred meters from there, we have our multi hull solutions yacht sales co office. So if anyone's looking for us, we're just there in Manly. <laughs> you'll get paid this month. <laughs> All right, keep going. So look, you know the iconic destination in Morton Bay has to be Tangaluma. Um, I actually, I actually run my yacht commercially, and I've been out there a ton <laughs> this last summer. I actually, I enjoy going out every single time. Um, so that's just a photo that I've taken. Um, and um, yeah, it's a just really nice spot. Um, just have to be careful. Not a great place to get caught in a, in a cold front. That's it. Yeah, totally. Very good. Okay, and obviously it is. Sorry. We could, we could talk about all the different attributes and, and, and negatives of each anchorage, Greg. But the thing to know is that in the book, you're going to give them all of that information as to when it's not a good place to anchor, when it is, what sort of conditions to avoid. The detail yeah, no, we're about, absolutely, absolutely. So go the detail even. about every one of these anchorages, guys, that are watching that you want is going to be in that guide. If we were to try and cover each and every aspect of, of 13 anchorages that cover 900 miles here, um, we'd be here until this time tomorrow. So. Yeah. And if you wanted to break it down and spend three more days in Morton Bay, there's a ton of other great anchorages. Oh, all yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a great cruising ground. I will just point out one thing. Um, up the top up the top of the chartlet, you'll see some little icons. So we've got a setting sun and we've got a sun over a beach. We've got a person swimming and we've got, and we've got a set of snorkels. Now, for each of the anchorages, these are the activities that I recommend. And Tangaluma is fantastic for all four of those. Um, 
Yeah, so each, you know, that's just a, a really, you know, in terms of more information, it's just another thing that, that's there. All right, let's have a look at the Sunshine Coast. All right, so um, like let's uh, Sunshine Coast, uh, let's jump in. Um, you've got a few uh, marinas in there. You've got um, the one I, you know, Malulabar Marina. Um, what's great about that, it's a large marina. And as you can see, it's, it's just inside. Um, a couple of things to note about Malulabar. There, are, there is no fuel wharf. The fuel wharf was removed. Um, uh, and you actually have to go, um, you have to actually head uh, through the canals um, to, to a refueling, special refueling um, establishment. So I've got all that detailed. Uh, Chippo's fuel supplies, it's, I can actually see it right there. And, and you've got to go, the, the thing is the canals are quite shallow. So you've got to go down there in high tide. It's really quite a pain. Um, you know, apparently the, um, yeah, there was a lot of pressure on not to renew the fuel wharf, um, but there's still all the commercial wharves. Anyway, it's just something to note about Malulaba. And of course, the other thing to note about Malulaba is that the, um, the bar, the Malula bar coming in through that seaway is very often shoaled. There is a sand bypass, um, permanent sand bypass pump there. Um, but four or five times a year, there's a dredge that comes in for weeks at a time to clear it. So in the book, um, for each coast, we have all the, the quick reference, including notices to mariners and so on. It's, and, and I have a whole section on entering Malulaba. And I, I've, got a, I've got links to the notices to mariners. It's very, very critical that you, you look at those and that you also talk to the local VMR um, before, uh, before going in and out, just so you've got all the up-to-date knowledge. Just Greg, before you move on from there, um, there is a, depending on your tolerance for swell, um, we've often anchored in this bay right here. Uh, our cat was a shallow draft, so we we're able to sneak right up in here and get as much relief as we could from the swell. Um, but you know, in the instance that we didn't want to continue onwards, um, we have anchored in there for the night. So it is, a, it is possible, but just be aware there's swell inundation here that um, it'll just depend on your tolerance for that as to whether it suits you or not. And I suppose and the other thing to say about Malulabar, um, you are able to anchor in the duck pond, they call it the duck pond, which is uh, the area south of the wharf marina. Um, the problem is there's, a, there's, some, there's some very unusual rules that they have there. You, you're, um, you can actually leave your yacht anchored without you on board it indefinitely, um, which is allowed. So you actually have a large number of vessels that are literally anchored. They're not moored, they're anchored permanently. Um, and so the duck pond is more or less full most of the time. So we've tried a couple of times, just haven't been able to get in and we've ended up in the, um, in the marina, yeah. And just a couple of points there. If you love seafood, all of those boats there are trawlers and there is an amazing fish restaurant. <coughs> oh there. yeah. And yeah. if you like to surf or swim, that beach there is Malula Bar Beach, which is probably one of Queensland's most fam famous um, or, or popular uh, uh, family swimming and surfing beaches. Yeah, look, it's a seriously fun place to go. Um, you know, from Brisbane, we've gone up there multiple times just for two or three days. It's like a mini holiday. Isn't there a yacht broker up there, Bob? Oh, yeah. Sorry, just on the shore <laughs> there, there's another yacht brokerage. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that one. What's oh. the name of that one? Uh, that's Multi Hole Solutions and the Yacht oh, Sales yeah. Co. Okay, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, James Beebe's our man there. He's a great guy. Can't see James. So there's really not much in the way of anchorages uh, on the Sunshine Coast. Um, there's pretty much only one, and it's arguable whether it's on the Sunshine Coast or the Kigari Coast, but it's uh, Double Island Point. Um, and Greg, um, Greg Luck, I'm just going to skip back two slides to give people some perspective here, just slightly sorry. So we were here, guys, at Malula Bar, and then we've ventured onwards up here to Double Island Point. Sorry, Greg, yeah. just to help. Yeah, unless you want to sort of tuck around and just sit in the bay at Noosa, there's not, not really anywhere else to stop. Um, mm -hmm. So um, a couple of years ago, um, a lagoon, a natural lagoon formed um, in, um, in, in Wide Bay, which is the bay behind um, Double Island Point. Um, and it's changed shape a few times. But if you're, um, if you're planning on, on anchoring there, um, what, uh, it's good to actually, the, the um, Cruising Queensland Facebook group, um, you know, they have the concerts, I think it's about 1,500 members, and there's always people going past there and always taking photos of what the lagoon and what the bar, uh, whatever, whatever it looks like. Um, 
the the lagoon i think at all times it's really only been suitable for for cats not monos the monos tend to sit just just outside but they still get some protection from the swell that wraps around Fantastic. And there's also a gentleman called Peter Gash, who for years and years has been flying his CSC planes, oh, sorry, uh, planes up to Lady Elliot Island. And he also takes photos of that end of Wide Bay Bar and gives them to the Coast Guard up there. He, he owns Lady Elliot. Photos. Yes, he does. Yes. Yeah, no, we went up to Lady Elliot last year, met uh, Peter, his daughter. Yeah, so yeah. so um, if you, that's another good thing to point to make too. The Coast Guards, the, uh, like the, SC rescues out of Tin Can Bay and Bribey Island, place like that. They're also good to get on their Facebook pages because they often have localised information. Just for yeah. those coming up here, um, we call them VMR, um, yes. not Coast Guard. So in Queensland, we're VMR, Volunteer Marine Rescue. So you would be um, contacting VMR. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, ju actually, just on that point, in New South Wales, um, there was a merger of the two rescue organisations about 10 years ago. Um, in Queensland, we actually have two organisations. We have Coast Guard um, and, we have, uh, and we have VMR. They colloquially or together they're called VMR and they all have VMR call signs. But yes. there are two sep distinct separate organisations. Um, one's and, orange um, and one's white and blue. Yeah, so we've back, in the quick reference, we've got every single one listed so you know, you know who you're dealing with. It is possible to sort of buy a membership with Coast Guard, which is like an, like an RAC Cura, NRMA, you know, um, breakdown assistance. You can do that with Coast Guard. The BMRs are all individual memberships, however. And while we're there, I'm not sure if uh, it's later on, but remembering too, that you can also use those uh, stations, the BMRs, uh, to log on and log off or to, uh, to yeah. uh, no, that's noti notify absolutely. your progress up the coast. Yeah. We have um, in, in the book, the first 150 pages is called things to, to know before you go. And there's all these types of things. Yeah, we have all that information on how to do that. Safe tracks, the log on, the log off, all the different choices that you've got. But it's a very, very good idea to let them know. So, you know, if you're in trouble, it just it just speeds the um, it speeds the response. It's another one of the benefits of doing a coastal cruising season rather than a uh, offshore passage. All right, let's flick on, guys. All right, so a little bit of an eye, an eye chart here. There's plenty to look at. Um, so if you want to go, if you want to go up around the outside of Fraser Island, um, it, it's a long way until you get into a, a known safe anchorage. Um, you're looking at about a day and a half nonstop. Um, so, um, typically when we go if we're going north with a crew i will go up around the outside and i'll just go up to the wet sundays non-stop just to get up there but if i'm cruising with my wife and we're doing trying to do day cruising um, then we do the inside so the inside passage is where you come in through the wide bay bar come in through inskip point um, so we've got the route there now that route is uh the route is shown in the in the may edition of ahoy magazine and obviously also in the book it's one of the many passages just want to point out something with the with the wide bay bar so the wide bay bar is another one where we go into a great amount of detail in the book about you know how to plan for it how to cross it um, one thing i want to show you is just how significantly the the route through the bar changed between 2020 and 2021 for those of you on the on the, on on this webinar that have been up and down the coast quite a few times in past years, but maybe you haven't since COVID, um, just be aware that um, Waypoint One has moved uh, about a nautical mile further north. So, as always with the Wide Bay Bar, you contact the VMR Tin Can Bay to get the latest uh, coordinates. They um, they work with with surveys. Now they used to do a survey a year. They've now changed that. They're now doing two surveys a year and there are at least two updates to the waypoints per year. So it's another change to previous years. Four, four weeks ago, a colleague of mine was um, uh, delivering a boat up there, had the AIS turned on on the uh, radio, which on his, you know, his AIS was turned on, was heading in and next minute got a call on the radio from VMR. Uh, Tin Can Bay, and they basically said 
we're, we've got you on our screen. You're not going in the right way. You're going the old way. And they basically verbally guided him back across to where he should be. But that was very useful. Wouldn't have been able to be done if he didn't have his AIS on. Yeah, it's, a, it's important. It's really important that, that people, you know, it's always the case. You, you don't assume you know the waypoints, you get the latest information. Mm. Um, but, you know, this year, more important than usual because of the big yeah. change. Yep. Oh, Everyone's good. got an opinion about crossing that bar. Um, mm. And I'll just share my rule from, from my perspective um, with my tolerances. I have a, a one five rule. Nothing greater than 1.5 metres of swell and nothing greater than 15 knots of wind. Yeah. Lovely. I agree with that. And then, of course, you've got to do it with the tides. But we could sit here for an hour and talk. Yeah, about we that. could. Think Greg, <laughs> Greg's, books book's, going, Greg's book's going to explain it all. Yeah, very good. And, okay, and the book, mate, and John, the book agrees with you that most cruisers <laughs> use 1.5 meters, significant wave height. Um, the the trawlers go uh, go up to two. Uh, okay, that's it. Yeah. We'll keep moving along, guys. Just Greg, you want to just touch on the inside route here? Yeah, yeah. So the inside route, um, you know, like the like the inside passage from the Gold Coast to Morton Bay. If you haven't done it before, it's 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 complicated, um, and so that's where having you know being able to import the passage um, really helps. There's a there's a shallow spot at at Sheridan Flats, which is sort of midway along. Um, oh, actually, on this chart, it's up near the top. Yeah, and and um, you do need, depending on your draft, you may need the highest tide of the day so the second higher tide of the day to get through which may mean that you're getting in uh you're going through at night we've gone through at night plenty of times the other thing from a planning point of view um we always cross the wide bay bar at high tide or just before high tide uh, which means the tide's dropping once you get in once you get in there's yeah. quite a strong current outflow outflow uh, uh tidal current which is like about four knots four or five knots uh, at its strongest. So it's also quite difficult once you get through to then get up to that midpoint. So you've got to, you need, you, you can't, you can't, um, you can't just come through and keep going. You basically need to, you need two high tides, one for coming in through the wide bay bar and another one for going through Sheridan Flats. Very there's a there's a plethora of anchorages in here that Greg's got in the book from, yeah. that, and there is, th th this area is literally one big anchorage. So yeah. there's no issue with finding what, anywhere to stop. So where are we going now, Greg? All right. Well, let's um, let's so talking about uh, yeah. Well, let's let's talk about a marina that maybe a lot of people don't go to, um, Tin Can Bay Marina. I find it really charming. Um, we had to go in there because <laughs> nice word. Of, charming. <laughs> we we had to go there. It's down the bottom down here. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we were coming south and we didn't have enough fuel and, and we did some jerry cans out of Kingfisher Bay and then we went into Tim Can Bay. Uh, but, I yeah, I just found it really nice. There's a nice restaurant there. It's a little bit off the beaten track. And, uh, yeah, we just very much enjoyed it. So I thought I'd throw it in here. Great spot. Okay. Um, right now, the, at the once you, once you get to the top, um, top of the Sandy Straits, um, um, and you, you, you know, in the start of Harvey Bay, you have some nice, you know, it's it's a beautiful big bay. So at the, um, uh, you know, just 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 before the the kink, just before the you know the northwest corner, northwest corner of Fraser Island, before it, it before the great big sweep of Platypus Bay, um, you have a place called Moon Point. Um, now, this is not one that I recommend for everyone. It's quite a small anchorage and you do need tidal assistance to get through there. In fact, the depths, I showed the depths there. You see my little um, infographic? The depths there, um, the LAT is like from point half a metre to two metres. Um, if you're a cat, you'd probably be a bit more game to go in there. We draw 2.1, but uh, I, I made the effort. The chart down the bottom is, is, a, is a live, so it's called Sonar Chart Live. So, so you can create your own depth chart on on, um, on uh, Navionics. So I basically went in there at high tide, drove around for about half an hour, driving my wife, Maria, absolutely nuts -o, while I surveyed the bottom to pick a safe spot to stop. But it was just beautiful. And there was the sunset that we had. 
So John, before we um, jump onto the next slide, can you jump back to the original, you know, the, the map of the coast? So we can just give people a reference of how far up we are now, please. How far uh, yeah, so there's, no, there's, no, moon no, point. No. there's Moon Point. Um, I mean the, the full Queensland coast. Oh, map. the full. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's quite uh, a few spots back. A long way back, right? Yeah, okay. So basically we're, so at this stage, what we've, from You're the Gold Coast. Not as far Coast, as yet. Yeah, so from the Gold Coast up to Harvey Bay. Sorry, uh, question about notice, Jets. What's the guess? Uh, we've done how many miles up to there now? Of our 900 miles? No, no, of our 900 miles. Of our 900 miles, how uh, many miles? Of... Just under 200. Just under 200. And that's where we are at the top of the Great Sandy Straits. And it's a great place to be in autumn, like right now, yeah. beautiful place to yeah. be. Very good. All right, so we've- And actually, just course. before we move off this one, this is one of the, the few um, infographics that I show. So you'll see there, Moon Point. Um, I'm recommending that for northerly for, for sort of moderate northerlies through the easterlies. Um, it's a sand bottom, uh, you've got one bar of reception. Um, you're in the Sandy Straits Marine Park and you're in a blue zone. That's what that, that box means. And then you can click on that little wheel and that will show you the exact anchorage that I spent yeah, about half an hour surveying <laughs> to, to, find, to be safe for my 2.1 metre yacht. Very good. All right, next one. Bundaberg. Sorry? Bundaberg. Very oh, good. Bundaberg. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the locals refer to this as the Discovery Coast. Um, and uh, so we've got, um, so the main city there is, is, is Bundaberg, uh, Burnett River and Burnett Heads. Um, and then, um, you know, the iconic destination is Lady Musgrave Island. So let's take a look at both of those. Uh, Bundaberg Port Marina, um, John Hembray might have a few more words to say about this. Um, absolutely beautiful grounds there. Um, and the, the marina is actually uh, expanding this year. Um, uh, to, it'll have actually 180 berths uh, by August. Um, and just very, very convenient place to stop. Do you want to say a few more words about it, John? Yeah, just quickly, it, it, our, it's our preferred port of entry for the east coast of Australia um, for, for, for many reasons. The, the, the fact that it's an all-weather entrance, it's not a barred entrance, is a major one. Um, the, the entry channel is, is well marked and navigatable at any time of the day or night. Um, the depths in the river itself are, are sufficient for the deepest draft vessel because there's ships coming in and out of there. Uh, the marina suffers a little bit from, from silting from time to time, and it'll just depend on your draft as to where they'll position you, but they will always find a solution for you. Um, <clears throat> the convenience of it is that you've got the Burnett Heads uh, uh, village, which is up in the background here, and they run a courtesy bus from the IGA supermarket right down to the marina. They'll pick you up. As you can walk up there in about 10 minutes on dead flat ground and do all your shopping. They'll put your shopping into the IGA bus free and bring you back to the marina. And if you need to stop at the pub to grab a box of beer or something, they're happy to take you through the, the drive through or the pub and pick up your box of beer as well. So, you know, you when we're cruising, we haven't got cars, the provisioning thing becomes an issue. Um, so it's door to door service here and it's cost you no extra um, to be able to have that. Of course, you've got a nice restaurant there and you've got a well-equipped, well-stocked chandlery and, uh, and some, you know, a selection of trades and services if you need it. So um, the, from my perspective, it's a very convenient and, and well-established marina and they are very cruiser orientated. Very good. Very good. All right. Where are we going next, gents? All right. So we're going to go to Lady Musgrave Island. Um, so this is one that I cover in quite a lot of detail. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, this, has a, this has a deep uh, lagoon entrance um, and it's a, it's a huge lagoon and it's, it's on everyone's list. Um, yes. If you get out, if you get there in the right weather, it's absolutely heaven on earth. Um, I've, got, I've got nine um, anchorages marked there. Um, there's two different um, icons. There's um, the like one, two, three, five down that bottom corner. They're actually um, they're actually public uh, moorings. Um, you'll notice that there's a public mooring just outside the lagoon entrance, uh, number four. That is very convenient because if you if you get there, you really want to enter at still water, either either low tide or high tide, because you get quite a, a rush of water coming coming out there. 
Um, but that's just great because it's deep out there and, and just being able to jump on, jump on a mooring um, while you wait to come in. Um, um, yeah, um, no, it's an absolutely beautiful spot. Um, you know, you do have... And hey, let's sometimes explain. want to go there and don't go there if the weather's not right. Um, I would just say, just make sure you um, make sure you're not planning on going there in strong weather. So, two tips for the for those who are arriving at Musgrove for the first time and planning their passage: it's approximately sixty nautical miles from the mouth of the Burnett River to the entrance of the lagoon. You want to time your arrival to coincide with two things: tide, and as Greg's already mentioned, a slack tide, or um, you know preferably a slack tide or a incoming tide. The current in the pass, in the boat entrance here, um, it can get significant depending on the moon phase and the tidal range. Uh, and it does not flow directly um, through the center of the pass. You can get a little bit of offset. So you've just got to be, you make sure that you've, you've got good uh, steerage on the vessel and you've got good power on the vessel that you're able to, to maneuver it well through that pass. Don't be daunted by all that. It's much wider than it looks on that map. Um, yep. and, and it is very, very doable from a point of view of someone who's never done it before and it's their first reef pass. Don't, don't get frightened by doing it. It is something that it's, it's the absolute... Um, the first time I went there, I, I felt like I just rounded Cape Horn. I thought I'd really done something very cool. Um, and I, it sticks with me as the iconic thing. The second thing we need to know is that we, we need to time our arrival between the golden hour of 10 and 2. Why is, and, and we need good overhead sunlight. We need to be able to see um, what, what's going on with the depths inside the lagoon uh, when we're navigating in there. And if the sun isn't in your eyes or it's not high in the sky, the, the, it's difficult to determine the location of the, of the underwater obstacles, the bombies, the coral heads. So, um, you know, 10 and 2 is the golden hour for arriving with, with especially in the, in the winter or autumn months when there's less daylight hours um, and good overhead sunlight to, to, to navigate within the confines of the lagoon. Very good. Moving on. Moving on. And while we're moving on, just remember too, we've got uh, along the Queensland coast, you have a mixture of islands. And I think it's fair to say the majority of them are uninhabited, which, uh, you know, in many parts of the world, if there's an island, someone lives on it. Um, Queens, this Queensland coast we're talking about cruising along, there is so many areas where you'll at times be the only person there. Yeah, look, I mean, right. and um, English... most, of them, most of them are national parks, and yes. some of them are what's known as Commonwealth Islands. Um, yes. So all of the ones that have got lights on them are Commonwealth Islands. It's no. really important to understand, guys, that we're not doing this justice. We just simply can't, as you see, no. we've been here for a long time now, and we haven't. You know, we're halfway up the coast, and we've stopped at two different spots. Yeah. There's, there's, there's. You know, um, when you leave Musgrave, you've got um, what is it, Northwest? Yeah, the bunker uh, group. Yeah, right yeah. through the bunker group. It's replicated a number of times. Musgrave's the pick of them. I mean, we've got, we haven't gone into 1770. We haven't yeah. gone into Pancake Creek. Pancake Creek. Pancake Creek. No, we're literally yeah. picking one anchorage per coast. So, I mean, it's, it's just it's, it's, it's like, and, that, and, then, and then, you know, we've got to talk about 13 anchorages and 13 marinas. I mean, so let's get so on with it. Just, to, yeah. just let's go. we've skipped a lot and it's all in the book and it's very doable. Yeah. Uh, we've got now, we're up at the Capricorn Coast, Greg. All right, yeah, let's move along. Um, I might start... We might start moving a little faster over the marinas. Um, so let's let's move let's move ahead. Um, Keppel Bay Marina, um, that's a huge marina, 568 berth marina. Everything um, you need to know about it's there. Yeah, it's all there. Um, the iconic destination is Great Keppel Island. I think it's um, yep. probably the best island, best all round island on the entire coast. I Love it. I, agree. I used to work for Australian Resorts. Um, I used to actually like work there. Um, yeah, loved it. Um, so um, there's what's you know it's it's you've got you've got crystal clear water. You've got a big shallow sandy bay. Um, you've got lots of different uh, anchorages. Uh, you've got fringing reefs, fringing reefs with great snorkeling. Um, it's got it all. It's got it all. So really um, good walking tracks. No, yeah. walking tracks, absolutely. Yeah, it just has it all. Um, and in the in the at certain times of the year, it's got the perfect climate 
Sometimes it can be a bit chilly, but it's got the perfect climate on. So there's some of the most beautiful sunny winter days can be had. So the, important, the other important thing here from a cruiser's perspective for those that haven't been there, we've got a, a, an anchorage that's, that's giving us relief from the south, albeit it gets a bit rolly at times. We've got an anchorage that's giving relief from the east. We've got an anchorage that's giving a relief from the north. We've got an anchorage that's going to give us relief from the west. I mean, you, I literally spent three months circumnavigating <laughs> that island <laughs> in 2019 during COVID. We just went from anchorage to anchorage to anchorage. And Coles will deliver. You can get your duck groceries delivered on the barge from Coles to Fisherman's Beach, um, which is just extraordinary we didn't leave there for well, literally three months <laughs> yeah and at the end of at the end of fisherman's beach there there's the the hideaway it's just this really iconic laid back beach yeah. bar and yeah. you can get a meal there as well it's fantastic yeah very it's, good it's a gem all right. i hate to do it guys gotta push you along all right right oh let's keep going um next coast is the Mackay coast so, um, so we come up around the outside of shoalwater bay and um, sorry, I've got to stop you again. And we've just jumped over some beautiful places. We've just gone past <laughs> Port Clinton. Uh, anyway, we've gone. Well, I know, I know. It's just, it's so hard. It's so hard. I want to fly by. I mean, they're all there, but that's why you yeah. need the guide. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Annie, let's, let's, jump, let's jump. Let's jump in. I mean, the main marina for exploring this coast is the Mackay Marina. If we can move on to the next page. So just um, to give you an orientation here, we've come from down here. And, and we're going to highlight these two locations in this coast. Percy Islands, Duke Islands. Yeah. Yeah, There's your marina. Very good. Yeah, Mackay Marina. It's a good marina. Um, uh, Everything you need to know. Good base. Um, let's, let's move on. I think uh, the biggest highlight to discuss <clears throat> on Mackay Marina, for those who haven't been on the Queensland coast, Mackay is where we have the greatest tidal range. And uh, so, you know, huge tides there, but it's got a marina that's built for tides. Yeah, and in fact, in fact, the um, in fact, Shoalwater Bay, um, yes. the anchorages in Shoalwater Bay have got the highest range. It's almost five meters um, during spring tides, and <clears throat> yeah, we do talk about that in the book. And it is yeah, you have to be you have to be much more careful with your anchoring uh, as a result. Um, so the Duke Islands, uh, you've got Marble Island, Hunter Island. Um, these these are actually a homestead. Um, they're yes. privately leased. Um, anyway, we just they're just a bit out of the way. Um, we just love them. There's my wife and our um, cruising Chihuahua Tonto. Um, yeah, we we love Hunter Island. Um, we always stop there. Um, anyway, it's a personal favourite. Um, um, and what's uh, what's nearby? And if you're doing if you're doing straight lines, if you're doing passages that are straight lines. Um, Middle Percy Island is, is a stop on the way. Like if you're heading directly, you're coming around the, the outside of Shoalwater Bay and yes. then just trying to head directly up to uh, the Whit Sundays. Uh, it is absolutely iconic. Um, uh, so the, it's, it's a national park and you'll see a dotted section in the middle, uh, the middle of it there. That's actually a, a lease. So there's been a homestead there for a long time. They've always been very, very welcoming towards sailors. Um, they actually established the Middle Percy Island Yacht Club, which I'm a member of. I'm sure John and Greg are as well. Um, and they've got the famous A-frame. So all these yachts come and visit and you leave a piece of memorabilia from your yacht. It really is a yachting paradise. Um, now, this island, once again, um, I've got, we've got three anchorages. So you've got really good protection from northerlies um, there. You've got Rescue Bay and Whites Bay. Uh, Whites Bay is really pretty. And there's also a, there's walks on this island and there's actually a walk from Whites Bay yep. up to the homestead as well. I've done that. It's fantastic. Yeah. No, it's an absolutely iconic place um, to go to. All right. Wish we could just keep talking about it for yep. hours, but we're going to move on. Um, so we're at the Whit Sundays now. You know, a lot of you have probably been to the Whit Sundays. Uh, we cover it in great detail. Obviously, you also have another great cruising guide, 100 Magic Miles. Um, to use in the Whit Sundays. Um, let's just jump in. My personal favourite is the Port of Ely Marina. It's uh, it's the it's the newest marina. It's just really pretty. Um, you know, it's it's just a short walk into town and to the uh, and to the sailing club. Um, you've got bars there, and yeah, I just I just like it. And and without doing um, 
sounding like we, it's a paid promotion, let's also not forget the Able Point Marina is also in its own right. So very, very good quality marina like that. Oh, yeah, it's, it's an excellent place. marina. Of course, it's officially these days known as the Coral Sea Marina. Sorry, the Coral Sea Marina. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But they'll, 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 uh, they'll take your money either way. Yeah, exactly. But there's, they are great marinas. You're correct. Yeah, no, you're very well well set up there. It would be interesting to see whether... Um, uh, whether, um, I mean, the other thing, actually, I have another marina um, uh, here. So Shoot Harbour, would you believe yes. uh, the, the Shoot Harbour redevelopment includes, yes. I think it's four marina berths that you yes. can actually um, stay overnight at, at Shoot Harbour now on those pontoons. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, very good. And then I can't believe you guys went asked to pick your favourite anchorage in the Sundays. It's quite cool that you actually decided to go all the way out to the reef. Yeah, well, we, um, this was probably, I think, 2016, 2017, I forget exactly, but uh, we, we were cruising around with Sundays and there was, you know, there were about three days of reef weather forecast. Yes. And yes. when I say reef weather, I mean almost no wind. It's what we're seeing in that picture. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we, listening, I was listening to what John was saying about picking your way through the bombies to get into yeah. that anchorage. Well, it's not even an anchorage. This is, no. a, this is a lagoon, which has got more and more bombies the deeper in you go. So we very slowly and carefully picked our way in. And, and we kind of, when, when the bombies became sort of too much, we stopped. Yeah. Um, and then, then uh, we were the only yacht there. Then some others had the same idea. And before we knew it, we had a whole bunch of friends around us. <laughs> um, but look at that, that was, that was a sunset. It was just the most, yeah, that, that, this is literally the dream. Um, and the night and three times, days out there. The, the night times when you're on anchor out there is just incredible because it's a bit like what John's going to talk about. But um, yeah, on those calm nights, no uh, light pollution at all. Incredible. Yeah. Okay, we'll keep going. Bowen. All right. So, so Bowen, um, we've got some more iconic stuff coming. So let's jump into it. Uh, Bowen Marina. Um, is, is kind of the exact opposite of the Whit Sundays. It's a, it's a very small, it's actually a, um, it's a state boat harbour, uh, mostly for fishing, um, very, very minimal and basic marina there. Um, but, you know, great seafood. We often stop in there overnight, get, get some fresh prawns. Um, Bowen itself, well, the Bowen itself has got the most beautiful beaches. Yeah, and I actually wanted to highlight one there, Grays Bay. We used to go up there as kids. We had some relatives in Bowen. And I've got very fond memories of going to some of these beaches, but look at that. It's just, you don't get anything like that in the Whit Sundays. Yeah. Now, Bowen these days is part of the Whit Sunday Shire. So I think you'll see a lot more promotion of Bowen as a destination. Just for our international um, attendees, um, or those that aren't aware, there is the, uh, what we call stinger season. Um, in North Queensland, and there are months of the year, predominantly the summer months, but the the, the months either side as well, and 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 some some will say all year round, where swimming off the mainland beaches is, uh, it's highly recommended that you be wearing a stinger suit. Um, you can research all that yourself. I just want to make you aware that if you happen to be coming here and 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 you fly in for a visit, and you think that Greg Luck said I should go swimming at uh, Bowen <laughs> Beach, then make sure you've asked about whether you should be wearing a stinger suit or not. And also just one other point too, the thing we haven't mentioned is all this time that we're cruising north from May to October is there's also another mammal cruising with us uh, because uh, especially during those July, August, uh, June, July, August months, the, uh, the humpback whale sees them as well. So, okay. Yeah, we, we, um, yeah. they, they say that the, the whale population has been increasing 10% per year and that gels with what I've seen. And when yes. I first went up in 2010, we probably had, I don't know, three or four sightings. I mean, now hundreds of sightings. Um, just on the on, on marine hazards, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but on, on, in the things to, go, to know before you go, I have an entire chapter on yes. marine hazards. I list all of the marine hazards, a um, lot of information, crocodiles, sharks, stingers, all different <laughs> types of stingers and... Anything that can sting and bite you that might make you sick or kill you, everything's in the book and how to mitigate it, um, how, to, how to know if it's there, when it's there, 
Yeah, it's very important to have that knowledge, especially if you're new to the area. Um, yeah. and, and there's a lot of myth and there's a lot of, of misunderstanding. So be informed by someone who knows what they're talking about, such as, as Greg Luck in the book. I just right, just, yeah. on that, just on that point, um, finally to point something out. So in the chartlet, we're now looking at Gloucester Passage, which is another iconic favourite. Now in that chartlet, up in the top left-hand corner, you'll see there's two icons. Now these are not the happy, let's sit in the sun um, or go snorkeling icons. These are hazard icons. So every single anchorage chartlet in the book has the hazard icons. Now, these are not my opinion. These are from uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. So if the park, park on that, uh, that's in that chartlet and, and Gloucester Island is a park, uh, national parks will say whether they believe, uh, you know, what the hazards are. And so for this one, stingers, like we were just talking about, but also sharks. This is one uh, where they have a, uh, actually shark warning out um, uh, for the, um, I think, till 2023. Uh, Greg Luck, just for those that aren't familiar, we've left the Whit Sundays proper now. We're heading north again. Um, we're, we're at the northern side of, 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 the, of what you would probably call a Whit Sunday group. Uh, in Gloucester Passage. So, That's right. And, and Bowen is actually considered the official start of, of, uh, of far north Queensland. So we've left the Whitsunday coast. We're right. On. And, we, and we need to speed it up a little bit, gents. So if we can jump through Gloucester Passage and then... Yeah, so Gloucester Passage, um, Gloucester Passage is... is, is um, there's Monty's Reef Resort there. There's the Gloucester Resort. Um, you can, you can, you know, it's, you can, it's a great place to shelter from the usual trade winds. You can also get a little bit of shelter from northerlies in the passage itself, and we feature those anchorages. Uh, and if we just move on, there's um, so the, the Gloucester Passage has been made famous by the Shag Island Cruise and Yacht Club. I'm sure many of you on the on the webinar are, are members. Of, I'm a I'm a member of uh, of the Shaggers, and and there's the prostrate cancer prostate cancer um, icon that everyone's made with their dinghy. So that's on in August uh, each year, the rendezvous. Um, yeah. And just so okay. everyone is clear, there is actually an island called Shag Island there. It's not uh, what you think, don't think so dirty. Yeah, there's a okay. tiny little island, tiny little island in the western part of the passage. If we just go back to the previous slide, we John will move. highlight it, that's it there. Now, interestingly, its official title is Passage Island. Passage Islet, but um, but that's the that's the islet that's referred to uh, by Shag Islet. I think Shag Islet might have some extra sh connotation. It does have shags on it, but <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah. it, officially it's Passage Islet. righty, let's keep going. Are we going to Townsville next? We're heading up there. Yep. All right. So now we've got the Townsville coast. It's a, it's actually a little bit of a haul from Bowen to Townsville. And you've got no protection from northerlies. Um, so you've got Cape Upstart, um, but, but to get up there, you've basically got to commit to two very long sailing days. Um, and, uh, there is, there is, uh, there is a possible stop at Cape Bowling Green, but I strongly recommend it, recommend it in, against it in the book. And I provide the reasons why it's not a safe anchorage. Um, anyway, once you get up there, it, it's, uh, it's just beautiful. So let's jump into it. Um. You can go to Magnetic Island. There's a uh, marina has been up there open for about 10 years called Maggie Island Marina. Um, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, all right, Orpheus, oh, we're jumping all around. Right. There's, there's the wife and dog. Um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's just, a, well, I love Magnetic Island, very quirky. Um, anyway, moving, moving, you know, one, you know, just so much more to see. Our favorite of ours is Orpheus Island. Um, You've got in Pioneer Bay there, you've got the uh, giant clam garden. Um, there's a, a clam plantation. The clam's now very mature. And you've got a research station there as well that you can tour. Um, Morpheus Island Research Station. Then down the bottom, there was a degaussing station um, used in the war. Um, it's called Yanks Jetty. And if we go to the next page, there's a, um, that is the, that's the beach at Yanks Jetty. Yanks Jetty is just behind me. It's just the water is so clear, so beautiful. We actually went swimming there. Um, absolutely loved it. Um, so that's Orpheus Island. Uh, there's also a resort on Orpheus Island. Now going going north of Orpheus, you get to Hinchinbrook. Now Hinchinbrook is like is like to me, um, 
I always think of it as, as like the island in Planet of the Apes. It's just otherworldly. It's just an amazing island. It just comes straight out of the water and basically touches the clouds. Um, I've actually hiked the island from north to south. Um, the big standout on the island um, is Zoe Falls and Zoe Bay. So let's jump into that. Just before you do, Greg, sorry, just to make it clear for those watching, you've got an inside passage through Hinchinbrook Channel or you can go out around the outside. So it's, it's much like being back down in Moreton Bay, Gold Coast, for, from that perspective. You've got the inside passage, you've got the outside passage. And actually, just on the, just on the entrance to the, the Hinchinbrook Channel, um, they've got a, a port entry light called a Pell light now, to actually, um, which was installed about a year ago, to actually show you, just like they have in the Malula Bar, to basically line you up to come through the shallows into that channel. So All right, there's, uh, there's, what's that? Our favourite anchorage here. Yeah, Zoe Bay, beautiful. Yeah, been there a couple of times. Um, and then there's there's some pictures of Zoe Falls. It, it, it really is, yeah, quite an extraordinary, beautiful place. And then at the top of the falls, there's a pool, and that's a photo of the pool in the top in the top corner. It's just it is just an absolutely beautiful place to visit. So we're anchoring the boat down here on the chart, but you can see this is the anchorage. The boat would be here. We wander yeah. up here to the top of the falls and we're in this infinity pool. Yeah, and the, right and the, track, the track is just, just a, ordinary. The track is at the southern end of the bay and that's why you try and anchor down the southern end and also get a little bit more protection. All right, um, moving along, um, as you can see, we've got more islands um, and then let's have a look at some standouts. Uh, let's have a look. So Port Douglas Marina, um, you know, maybe... Um, so it's the Crystal Brook Super Yacht Marina. Uh, I mean, Port Douglas, it, you know, is a famous resort town. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like the Byron Bay of the North, I suppose. Um, it's like Byron Bay of Noosa. It's a very iconic resort town. Um, it's on a headland, just like those places are. And then we've got a marina tucked around on the protected side. Um, the, you know, one that is on everyone's bucket list is the Low Islets. Um, and uh, very beautiful, um, easily accessed from, from Port Douglas. You've got some, you've got some moorings there. Um, you've, got, uh, you've got great snorkeling. Um, yeah, absolutely beautiful. It's a great place to stop. All right, um, now moving, moving further on, um, uh, Cooktown. Uh, one, thing, one thing, by the way, about the, uh, the Cassowary Coast that Hinchinbrook Island is on, there is no marina there. Um, so as you get further north, you have to start being more careful with your food and your, uh, with your fuel and your water and your food. The provisioning, um, restocking, refueling becomes much more important. So let's take a look at Cooktown. The, the so-called marina at Cooktown, uh, Cook's Landing, is actually one long pontoon. Um, so it's a one, it's one 70 metre long pontoon. They'll accommodate people there overnight. You can refuel there, rewater. Um, but yeah, you sort of the, the facilities now start to dramatically drop off. So um, yeah, now let's now the, the iconic, you know, we're right at the end of the presentation, my presentation, the, the iconic destination, of course, on the, on the Cooktown coast is Lizard Island. I used to work for Australian Resorts. I've, I've been up to Lizard probably, I don't know, more than 10 times. Um, the, the main anchorage there, uh, so you've got the resort and then just along to the east of that, um, you've got Watson's Bay. So Watson's Bay faces northwest. So it gives you extremely good protection from the trades. You can see all my icons up there of all the things to do. You've got everything. You've got everything on Lizard. It's absolutely beautiful. And of course, you can, you can follow in Cook's footsteps and walk up to Cook's Look, which is how he tried to find his way out of the Great Barrier Reef. I've had the view from the top of there into that anchorage as my screensaver on my computer for about 15 years, I think. <laughs> it's just an iconic place. Now, now on, the, on the southwest corner of the island, um, you have to have the right weather there. This is not a place to go on the trades, but if you get the right, the right weather, you've got the um, southern lagoon. Now, I've, act, I've been in there snorkeling. Um, I actually got attacked by a reef shark in there. I'm <laughs> doing everything wrong. The good news is he didn't bite me. He just scared me. <laughs> so you didn't get attacked? No, no, no yeah, I didn't got, get attacked. I just nudged. I just saw him. You know, he was, he was, I was exciting him by my ridiculous thrashing. Yeah. When you're, when you're, when you're up on the reef and you're 100 metres away from the boat, 
don't just decide you're going to make the big the the, 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 the you know don't don't decide that you're just going to thrash your way along the surface back to the boat you just attract anything within a nautical mile which is what i did that day all right all very good so we're at lizard island and for this exercise that's where we're going to turn around and uh, sit and wait for the northerly to come before turning around and heading south and for anyone that wanted to uh, continue north, you can. It's about another 300 nautical miles from there up to the top of Australia. Um, and uh, having been up that coast myself, it is uh, just another experience to try and put on one's bucket list. But for now, we have to turn around and start heading south before we get in trouble for, because we're not home. Yeah, so we, in the interest of time, there is a 10-minute walkthrough video yes. uh, which basically walks you through the Capricorn coast. Um, we don't have time to show that for you. It's on, on the website, website listed there. Um, and uh, yeah, have a look at that and that'll show you what you know what a typical coast looks like. Um, the book itself, it's available as an ebook on Apple Books, Google Play Books and Kindle, $89.99. Um, and uh, yeah, you can learn more about the book uh, on the website. Um, yeah, thanks very much, guys. You've done really well, Greg. We've really compressed you. If there's so much information to share and we've asked you to compress it into a short point, uh, space of time, but that's really good. And I think one thing that we've all gained out of that is that, <laughs> first of all, congratulations, because to put together a book like this uh, must have been, once you start it, it's like, oh my gosh, how do I get to the end of this? You've done it. And as a resource uh, for people cruising the coast, I think it's going to be very well received if as it has already based on uh, what you've been telling us well thanks very much greg now i don't mean to cut you off but we now need to listen to mr hembrow so he can tell us how to get there the other way <laughs> yeah all right guys i'll i'll speed through this um for those that are interested you know how to get in touch with me and i'm happy to share as much information as you would like to be given so the alternative route beyond the barrier, um, that's me sitting on one of the OPBs. We chartered that vessel for this rally last year. Peter Sayer is the authority on this region and that is his commercial vessel, the Phoenix. It's been running out there for over 20 years, all year round, cyclone season including. This guy is a master mariner and a guru and a lovely, lovely fella to boot. So Phoenix, Peter Sayer, if you ever get the chance to say hello. We're going to go into the Coral Sea Marine Park. So as you can see, the Coral Sea Marine Park here extends from Bundaberg. And we're heading well, east, northeast, and we're going out into, this is the whole area of the Coral Sea Marine Park and what it encompasses. Almost a million square kilometres in area. It's one of the, 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 the world's largest marine parks. Um, it is truly an extraordinary place. Um, and it's a well-managed marine park in that it's not all green zone. There's a, a multitude of, of, of zones that allow various activities in there. So it's, it's not like we're going out there and we've got to keep our hands in our pockets. There's some areas we do need to keep our hands in our pockets and there's other areas where we're free to have, uh, you know, more, there's more freedom. Uh, it's very important to make sure you're across the zonings. Uh, I will also just mention for those that don't come with us and don't get the benefit of all the information that we share, if you want to fly a drone out here, you need to get a permit from the Coral Sea Marine Park Authority. Um, and, and the challenge with that is if you don't get the, the permit and they see your drone footage when you come home, when you're showing everybody, um, you could well find yourself with a, uh, a smack on the wrist or worse. So make sure you get a permit if you want to fly your drone out here. Um, why do we go out there? This is indicative of what we go out there for. There's 67 of these pristine coral caves and islets the one we're looking at now um, is aptly named Diamond Islets, and this is East Diamond. Uh, we spent a, just a magnificent five days here um, last year, twice, once in June and once in August. Um, yeah, look, it, the photo doesn't even do it justice. It is extraordinary. And you can see the anchorage there with the, the crystal clear water that the boats are all in and the bombies and the coral and the fish. And, all sorts of things. The clear ocean water for me, that's the that's that's what calls me. Um, I love these 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 places where we can just got visibility from for as you know extraordinary visibility. Um, there's no filters or anything on these photos. These are taken straight off my Sony camera. Um, it it's just an extraordinary place. The boats you can see there are the fleet from the 2021 Beyond the Barrier Rally. 
we were the only boats we saw for the whole time we were out there. Three weeks we were out there and the only boats we saw were the boats that were participating in our rally. There's abundant marine life and, and it really does. I mean, these are our photos. There's, these aren't, aren't Photoshop, they're nothing else. We've, we've got these photos from, from being out there. Again, my own photos and the locals being the, the marine life, they just don't seem to have any fear. Um, the birds would land on you if you let them. Um, and the little crabs are running around there, the beach. It, it is, it's just a, a pleasant place to be um, and it's, it's refreshing. It's unspoilt, uh, it's a marine park. It's been well man managed and well maintained. World-class dive sites, if you're a diver, um, these again are the photos from last year when we were out there. They're, they're not anything that we've conjured up. This is the photos from when we were out there on the rally last year and that's Peter Sayer's wife, Michelle there on a dive with the big coral fern there. Fishing's pretty good as well. Again, these are our rally participants from last year with some of their catch uh, whilst between locations and some of the, a nice coral trout there, one of many that was caught in and around the areas where we were permitted to fish. Uh, just on that one, John, while you're there, um, participation of people in power boats on your events. Um, oh, um, this coastal one has seen more power boats than previous blue water ones. Um, uh, it's the range is an issue yes. by and large, Greg, with fuel ranges. Um, but yeah, we 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 had uh, uh, three three large power boats do this last year. If the if the owner of the boat is comfortable with their fuel range, given your planned passage, and they're happy to join, then that's all fine. Absolutely, as long as they've got the yeah. yeah. I'll talk about what yeah, you need cool. to have to get out there. Um, look, the, the big thing about this place is that it it's it's. I keep saying it's not for the faint-hearted, and I don't say that because I'm trying to be some sort of hero here. I, I'm wanting people to understand that we are totally reliant on weather. We're going to be out there for three weeks. It's more critical to get to, to be uh, competent and resourceful on this than it is an ocean passage. I would say cruising the Coral Sea is a bigger challenge than, uh, than, a, than a, going from Australia to New Caledonia. I, I, I believe that coastal cruising is far more challenging than ocean passage cruising. And having said that, with these locations, we've got no anchorages that are going to give us any respite from anything other than south through easterly quadrant winds, with the exception of one or two that are well spaced apart. Um, if we get, you know, sustained northerlies, um, anything with a north in it and, and west in it, sustained periods of time, by and large, we don't have any respite from it. Um, so we've got to be well, well aware of that and we've got to have get out of jail plan. So for each of the destinations we go to, we've got a route that will get us back to the mainland, an express route, um, which takes us through the Swains Reef or through the Hydrographer's Passage or wherever we need to go to be able to get back to the mainland within 24 hours, should the weather forecast suggest that we're going to have anything other than settled trade wind conditions. If you can't access weather uh, whilst you're outside of internet connectivity, um, don't go out there. You need to have some sort of satellite uh, internet capability and you really need to know how to read the weather information you're being provided with. Um, a forecast is one thing, interpreting the forecast is a whole nother thing. So just understand it. One of the really cool things you can do to get an idea of what I'm talking about here and to quantify what I'm talking about is go to this website that you're seeing on the page You'll see this arrow pointing up here and it's got a drop down box to the month of the year, it's June. This is the historical wind data for the last 10 years for the whole world, every ocean in the world. You can click on there and see which way the wind's been blowing and you can drill right down into it. And if we clicked on one of these arrows like I've done here, it brings up this windrose box that shows us the percentage and strengths of the wind in that month of the year. A really great cruising resource, regardless of where you're going especially uh, not so much coastal because of the topographical effect that, that, that the land's going to have on the wind angles, but ocean cruising, pretty good planning resource. If you want to go out here, you've got to take this book. Um, this is the author of it, Peter Sayer, that I mentioned before. He's just doing a new edition. It's sitting on the, in the customs brokerage house at the moment, waiting to be released so it can go out to all the people that have ordered it. Um, 50 bucks. If you buy it by through our website and you're down under a Rally member, you'll get 10% off. 
If you want it, you need to pre-order it now because he's going to increase the price for the second edition. But if you order it now, you'll get the second edition for the first edition price. Okay, we're going out there again this year. We're going twice. We're doing leg one from Bundaberg to Townsville. I'll show you the route in a minute. Um, and we're doing leg two from Townsville to Port Douglas. Again, our own photos from our own image library of last year. So route, uh, route one, we're going to depart Bundaberg and we're going to do 60 nautical miles to Lady Musgrave to just let everyone get their sea legs. We'll spend the night at Musgrave and then we're going to head on for Musgrave and do 125 nautical miles to Sumerez Reef. So um, those that are trying to work out how long this is going to take, we average our passage times for six knots. Um, so 10 hours to Musgrave, 20 odd hours to Sumerez. We'll spend um, time at Sumerez. We'll move on to Marion. Again, another 170 nautical miles. We'll move on to Lehu. We'll move on to East Diamond, we'll come into Flinders and we'll return through Palm Passage or Magnetic Passage into Magnetic Island. Total distance is 845 miles. The planned time that we're going to be out there is, 20, is 19 days. But at any time, if the weather conspires against us, we will retreat. I've got a passage that takes us from Sumerez straight the way through Swain's Reef. I've got one that takes us through Hydrographer's Passage. We've got one that brings us back down into um, with Sundays, so we can we can we can retreat if we need to. Um, yeah, look, I, I need hours to tell you about it. Departure dates and how long we're spending at each place. These are indicative. They're not they're not guaranteed. The weather will determine how long we spend. These are lovely to visit, Sumerez, Marion, but the real jewels are Lee who are East Diamond, and we'll be looking to maximise our time at these two locations. We may spend much longer there than we're suggesting we will we may spend shorter periods of time with the others. It's all driven by the weather. By the way, we won't depart on the 25th unless the weather forecast suggests two things. One, that the short-term forecast is suitable for us to make our voyages. And two, the long-term forecast is settled enough that we're not looking, expecting to get northerlies in the next week. So you're talking there about 10 days between Lehu and East Diamond of time shared between those two areas. Um, that would be our goal. Yeah, perfect. So can you um, can you just tell me when you're out there for three or four days in that one location, are you then uh, tell us about what you're getting up to out there anchored? A uh, typical morning, I'll we'll, we'll do a VHF radio skip and give share everyone the weather. I'm doing weather twice a day. So I'm informing everyone in the morning of what, what's coming up weather-wise and what we need to do in that regard. Um, and then we'll gather on, uh, Liam does yoga on the beaches. Um, yep. So she'll take the, those in that would like to participate in, in yoga and we'll do yoga on the beach. And then, you know, it's, it's free, free uh, what do you call yeah. it? Free time. Um, everyone's either going and fishing in their tenders. Um, they're going diving at the various spots. They're snorkeling the, the, uh, the inshore reefs around the caves. Um, they're just generally chilling and hanging out. And the day will end with uh, a sundowner on the beach with whoever wants to come in and, and join us for that. Perfect. Uh, sorry, so the next leg, uh, we've, we've got four boats that did the southern leg last year that have joined up to do the southern leg again this year. That's how much they liked it. Um, and they've also indicated they would be interested in going again. So we've, we've, we've planning to do another run. So we'll come back into Magnetic from the first one. We'll have 10 days to fix boats and, and, and drink beer at the pub um, and reprovision. And then we'll look for the next weather window to head back out and do the next section of the Coral Sea that's that's achievable for us, um, which will see us going via Flinders out to Chillot, Islet, Herald Cays, Holmes Reef, and back through Trinity Opening to Lower Isles. Um, not quite so many miles to cover on this one, but we'll be out there for the same period of time, or our goal is to be out there for the same period of time here. Doing this in company is is extraordinary. The, the community aspect of it that comes to the fore there with, uh, you know, somebody's impeller um, decided to give up the ghost in the generator and they bought the wrong one and somebody else had the right one. You know, they had a spare and it was the wrong one. Somebody else had the right one. Sales needing repair and everything. The, the, the cruising and company thing and the community spirit that was created is, is really, really lovely. So that's the June itinerary. itinerary. Again, the, the, this webinar is recorded. You can come back and look at these things for as long as you like um, at your leisure. We'll, everybody that's registered for the webinar with Multi-Health Solutions will receive an email from Rachel 
as soon as the live version of the webinar is available to view. Um, so you'll all be notified when that's up and you can just watch it again at your leisure and the parts that interest you most. Um, if you want more information on this Beyond the Barrier Rally with us, go to including and downloadable information packs on each of the rallies, the May and the June rallies, go to our website on the URL below. That is it from me personally. Um, I would just like to encourage everyone to, no matter where you're going to go, whether you're going to spend the weekend in Sydney Harbour or whether you're going to cruise the Queensland coast or you're going to sail around the world, just to do it, get out there and make some memories. Thank you, everyone. Very good. Now, don't go too far because we've got a couple of questions. Yes. So, and uh, we won't take too long. I don't think there's that many questions. But so uh, for those of you who, who have stayed with us, which, to be honest, is still a very large number of people, um, we're just going to do a Q&A session now for about five or ten minutes. Uh, but before we do that, John, thank you. Um, incredible. I think... The sailing community has a lot to thank you for the way in which you uh, guys have created these uh, these unique events uh, and to open up the uh, South Pacific uh, like that. Hey, to, Greg, uh, while we're on the Mutual Admiration Society there, <laughs> I, 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 I really appreciate you saying that. And I must also say to everyone out there that's listening, and it's not a, just a, a plug for the sake of a plug, we couldn't do what we do without the support of our rally partners, in particular, our platinum partners of which multi Health Solutions and the Yacht Sales Company are. By supporting us, I don't make enough money out of running yacht rallies to, to, to exist. It doesn't happen. Uh, the support that the rally partners give us make it so we can exist. And by existing, we're able to do what we do. So our That's heartfelt good. thanks go to you as well. No, it's very good. But um, wow, what you guys are doing, that that rally there, the idea of doing the uh, Coral Sea like you are is just, as you keep saying, it's not for everyone, but there's a whole group of people who I think are going to latch on and uh, give that a go in the next year or two. Now, um, before we go, gentlemen, a couple of questions. Um, we've got, uh, just I'll just run back to the beginning and then we, we, I don't think we, we need to cover them all. Uh, you saw that one and you've, you've picked up on it about the question about the list of, and maybe this is a good one not to, don't need to discuss, but Greg, uh, luck in your guide, there's a, is there a list or table or approximate times of sailing between different locations? I know it depends on different factors, but I'd love to learn more. It's a good point. Um, yeah, so, so there is. Um, so each chapter has got, um, after the quick reference, has got um, passages. And yes. so we have we have sort of all of the uh, all of the major passages. Um, so we've got where you're going from, where you're going to, um, how far it is in nautical miles. Now, just like John Hembro, he gives the distance in nautical miles. Now that's the distance followed by the route. It's not a straight line distance. That's the that's the route that I've got. Um, there's many factors that can you know affect the time that it takes yeah. you. Um, if you're, you know, if you're tacking, for example, it's going to take you a lot longer. Um, yeah. If you're motoring, then you more or less be able to get, you know, you'd be able to, you know, just basically work out what your motoring speed is and work out how many hours it'll take you. But I mean, to um, the, the routes themselves, you click on a, you click on an icon, you import it, um, and and then that's that can then start or serve as as the beginning of your own more detailed um, passage planning. Um, you know, to give you some idea, most, most of the passages can be done in a day sail. Yeah, of course. You know, the exceptions to that are if you want to go around the outside of Fraser Island um, and then the, the, the passages between, between Bowen, and, um, Bowen and, and Townsville or Bowen and Magnetic Island. Um, they're day passages, but they're long. It's like 12, 14 yeah. hour days. Very good. All right. Um, we've asked about power caps on the rally. Um, we've talked about Starlink. I answered that one because this whole presentation for me has been done using Starlink. Uh, heads up, uh, that, like that anymore. So, yep, we've got that. Thank you, Liz. Uh, okay, here's one. How do you manage on watch when on an overnight passage, two on board, three on board, or four on board? Do you have a system where each person can get enough sleep? So, 
Alan Metcalf, I'm going to get uh, John Hembrow to take that uh, question on notice and come back to you in an email. So, um, because we could talk all day about that one. That's another webinar in itself about passage planning and uh, passage management, but good question. Um, just, Greg, I will quickly just say to, to that, um, it's personal. I know yes. people that, that, that everybody, that not everybody that you talk to, but some people have a three hour, some will have a six hour watch, some will have a 12 hour watch. I know couples that do 12 hours on and 12 hours off. Uh, I can give you the information you need to make an informed decision about what should work for you and your experience level on your boat. Very good. Thank you. Um, oh yeah, there's been a few comments and more than one about cruising with a dog. Do any of you folks have cruises? Uh, oh cruise yes, dogs? yes. Let yes. me let me take this one. So, yes. so we, so Maria and I, so we've had our Chihuahua for eight years. So most of our cruising has been with our dog, um, and so we toilet trained the dog. Um, we have uh, the the so it's not very nautical, but one of the things that we have for every single coast, we've got every dog off leash park. And, and everywhere that you can take your dog. For example, you can take your dog to Middle Percy Island. You can take your dog to Great Keppel Island. You can take your dog to Magnetic Island. Uh, you know, we go into the legalities in great detail. Like, you know, what's the legalities for the marine park? What's the legalities for the islands? Um, and, and just one tidbit. So you can put your dog on the tender. You can, and if you park the tender below high tide and the dog is confined to the tender, cannot get off the tender, that is legal. Yes, that's well, correct. I have all of the, uh, I've got the legislation. I've had multiple government departments review what I said. Yeah, so yeah, we we cruise with dogs and, and it's, uh, it's a dog friendly. Oh, the other thing is with marinas, uh, we actually say whether or not dogs are allowed. So I've asked every single marina. Yeah, so it's all in the book. Yes, I'm well aware of that neutral zone between uh, high water mark and low water mark uh, along the Queensland coast. And uh, is that where you, know, you have to spend all your time? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm confined to that. Yeah, yeah. You, just get, <laughs> you just get down there. Um, so yeah, so um, so you're saying, Greg Luck, just to you're saying that you have actually covered cruising with a dog in the book. Is that correct? Yeah, I spent I actually spent four days. Yes, like laboriously checking through. Okay. Um, every single um, every single shire rules where they have their dog off leash parks, what their attitudes to dogs are, etc. So Excellent. yeah, no, I, I, it's just it's actually important to us, and it's important yes. to a lot of cruisers. Well, and increasingly so. Um, there was a comment there about how much chain would you need for places like Hook Reef is sixty meters enough. I did answer that uh, at the time. I said, yes, it's enough, but I'd also suggest picking up a mooring at Bay Reef as an alternative to anchoring. And the other thing I wanted to say there, Russ, to that question is once you're inside the lagoons and, you know, Hook, Hook Reef is, again, not an entrance for everyone. It's, uh, it's called the waterfall. But once you're inside, the depths inside the, uh, the reef system uh, aren't so bad. But it's also about having an absolute respect for the coral, um, for, for basically the the ecology there, you don't want to be anchoring if your anchor is going to swing and, and wipe out. So you've got to be at, probably first and foremost, you've got to be environmentally conscious when you anchor anywhere up along that coast. Yeah, my, my wife insists um, for coastal cruising that we carry 100 metres. Yes. I mean, John, what's your rule for, for, the, for the stuff that you do? Uh, I'd prefer to refer people to the offshore cruising prep course. Become a member. There's a whole passage in there, a whole chapter on anchors, anchoring and anchoring techniques for coral, including floating the anchor chain so it doesn't damage the coral heads. Offshore cruising preparation course down under that one. <laughs> Very good. Good. <laughs> um, okay, there was another question about dogs. So that's great. We've covered that. Uh, we also had the constraints. Which, what are the constraints for a monohole with 2.3 metre draft? I see lots of cats, so not sure. And I did answer that. I said, Laura, I would say that uh, the cruising percentage on the Queensland coast is still probably 80% mono to 20% multi, even though images show lots of cats. Uh, sailing the Queensland coast on a mono is perfect. You know, it's uh, it's one of the great things. It's It's a great cruising area, and that's what you've been doing, Greg, yourself. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I, you know, it, we draw two point one. So all of the all of the anchorages that I show, we can get into if they're a, if they're shallow for us. So we we can, you know need to do it at need tides, or we need to get in there. We need tidal assistance to get in there. I note that I have basically shallow. It's got it marked in red. If you're a catamaran, um, 
you know, you can go to every one of the anchorages that we go to, but also 2.1 meters, we're probably a typical draft for a large mono. Um, you know, racing boats are, are deeper. Um, one thing that, one thing like in the, in, in Lucas, um, in Lucas and, um, and the Curtis Coast, those two guides, those guys go into every nook and cranny. You know, they, they go up creeks and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, you know, in, 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 in my cruising guide, it's, it's practical anchorages that we can get into, yep. pra practical passages that we can do. Very good. Um, will the e-book receive ongoing updates? And uh, Rachel capably answered that to say, of course. And already since you released the book last November, you've had 14 updates. That's so, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, the rate of updates is slowing down a little bit now. Um, uh, but uh, I just put an update out this week. Um, uh, and the update before that was about two months ago. So every month or two, just as, as, as things change, as there's new things to say, um, I'll put out an update. One of the great things about an e-book is yes. I can I can push the update out and within 24 hours uh, it'll download to anybody that's bought the book. Yeah, that's very good. Um, and then thanks guys, well done, really good webinar. Okay, and then uh, sorry, someone has asked, what's the cost of your book? Uh, 89.99 um, okay. on, on all three. Uh, it's Australian dollars. If there's any internationals, uh, the book's available. You know, on Apple Books. Google Play Books and Amazon. I, I do recommend Apple Books or Google Play Books. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's not eighty nine ninety nine. So call it ninety dollars Australian, and it's the equivalent of that in international currencies. Now, Robert has asked another question here, and I reckon John Hembrow is going to swing it straight to the same answer as before. For offshore <laughs> or coastal without reception trips, how relevant is the day for weather facts? SSB, HF radio is a good alternative. Would also recommend him <coughs> another satellite-based internet. So I'd like to you... just give I'd yep. like to just give an answer, Greg. Um, yes. and of course, same thing. We cover this in depth in the offshore cruising prep course. So if you want an in-depth response, then please go to that. However, um, HF radio is still relevant. Um, yes. It's, 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 it's no longer the only alternative. Iridium, as you've said, is another alternative. Satellite-based internet connection is, is relevant. Um, it depends on what you're trying to achieve with, with the communication systems. Um, voice... If you're trying to achieve voice communications, um, single sideband, sorry, if you're trying to achieve voice communications over a long distance, single sideband radio is very effective and far more effective than the current Iridium option. <clears throat> um, having said that, single sideband radio was ineffective on our Beyond the Barrier Rally last year because the distance between the boats wasn't sufficient for the propagation to be uh, satisfactory. Um, so the boats really weren't able to communicate effectively using single sideburn radio because we weren't far enough apart for the skip to work. Um, so, you know, if you've got both, fantastic. If you haven't, the Iridium is my preferred alternative because I can get the weather using uh, Predict Wind in the Offshore app, which I just, I, I live by. Again, if you want more information to that, please contact me or check out the information now Offshore Cruising Prep course. Very good. Thank you. Um, and will the Beyond the Barrier Rally continue when you restart Go East, hopefully next year? I can't answer that at this stage. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, very good. We've answered all our questions. So there was a bunch of, uh, quite a number of thank you uh, comments there. So to all those people who said thank you, thank you. Um, so that brings us to the end. That is just on two hours, gents. We said it was going to be a long one, but the beauty of it is, is that Rachel will uh save it and and upload it maybe even split it into a couple of uh into two halves or whatever but um but yeah very good lots of information i don't think we've done the queensland coast justice to be honest i think we could sit here and just keep going and going and talking about it but people need to buy your book greg or they need to get on their yacht and go and sail it and discover it themselves yeah. so yeah but thank you both uh, wonderful. Good to see you again. Uh, we'll have to find something else to talk about in the next few months. All right. Thanks very much, <laughs> everyone. And thank you, Rachel, in the background for uh, coordinating. And uh, thank you for all those people who signed in and uh, joined us this afternoon. It's been great to uh, be, be back doing another webinar.
Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Rachel. And thanks to everyone who uh, registered and participated. It's a pleasure to provide this information. And uh, we hope to see you out there somewhere soon. See you at the Sanctuary Cove show, everyone. All right. Cheers. Au revoir. Okay.